good evening guys um hello compliments of the season to everyone and welcome to our last mentorship session for the year um this is exciting please let the other guys know that we have started and the whole plan is we're not letting 2022 go without taking everything that it has to offer however good or bad your day has been um, we need to be able to hand this 2022 with a bang. So as you guys have gone through quite a number of mentorship sessions so far and different other sessions that we've been having throughout the course of the month. And um, so what we've done is to pretty much save the best for the last. And we have an, a remarkable, um, a remarkable uh Good evening, good evening, good evening, Michael. So we have another a remarkable professional here with, with pretty much a whole lot of experience um, to be able to come in and tell us how we can conduct user research like an expert. So as you guys know, in the fashion that we do this, let us know where you guys are messaging from, which is going to uh, really help our speaker today. She's going to really help our mentor to understand where she is going to be um, pretty much talking about the different things that you guys are doing to give to put a lot of things into context. So Anita, I see you. Uh, Michael, I see you as well. All right, Kingsley, yes, I know you're from Delta. So Kingsley's from Delta. And um, yeah, I know it's just a few of us today, but it's good to see uh, you guys. You guys are making the effort and coming in here. So let's get other people on here to also encourage our mentor to be able to uh, speak to us properly. As we know, what we're going to be doing is we'll be asking just a few questions from me, but the bulk of the question is going to come from you guys. So you guys will be able to ask whatever questions you have regarding, um, you know, user research and how we could do this as an expert. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker today so that you guys can get to know her and then I'll leave her to be able to further elaborate and introduce herself and then I will start the question straight away. So our speaker today is Maria Dionofora. She is a solution analyst enthusiast with over 12 years experience in delivering businesses and technology change. Um, she has a passion for furthering projects that build brand loyalty by providing valuable solution in human, in, in human engineering and in turn growing business um, revenue. So today, as you guys can tell, this is someone with over 15 years experience. And we'll be pointing all of that into us for us to be able to ask the appropriate questions and learn from those, learn from the answers that she's going to be giving put that into our own career paths and be able to use that in, in ways that can actually really, really help us. We've gone through sessions that talked about mock interviews. We've gone through sessions about cybersecurity. We've gone through imposter syndrome. Now we are talking about, you know, user research and some other things that I've also gone through. I hope you guys are taking notes of all these things, applying them into your lives one way or the other to further benefit yourself and take your career to the next level. So Aria Day, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks that I understand that she's just basically landed and she decided to come on here today. I haven't even had the time to really speak to her. Probably she's landed and straight away, I thought we were going to cancel this session because I knew how difficult her schedule has been, but she still devoted the time and said she was going to be here. So thank you so much, Harriet, for being here. Please uh, further introduce yourself, as I know I haven't done it justice. Sorry, let me just come into full screen so that I yeah, can full see properly. Yes. Hello. Okay. Hi, everybody. Compliments of the season. I think you said it all. I'm not sure that there's anything more to add to that. I mean, there, there are various um, aspects of what I do, even as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, um, but everything all centers around, you know, developing products and services that make the world a better place, essentially. So whether it's me working as a solution analyst or whether it is me working as a, a, a business owner, it's still the same 
it's still the same, it still centers around the same thing, which is human engineering, knowing how to interact with people, knowing how to build products that make a difference and moving the needle in making sure that the world is a better place. So that's all I would add, but you literally said <laughs> about me. <laughs> <laughs> all right fantastic so we all want to make a world a better place and you know the, the the truth about it is a lot of a lot of um the people in our audience they have I, I can tell you they have very very good hearts they want to make sure that they are living the world better than they found it and also growing their career path one way or the other in order for them to do that, the only way you can do that is to learn from other people's experiences. And that's why we are doing this mentorship series where we are bringing experts like yourself that will be able to come in and point to them one way or the other. Pointing into them allows them to shape themselves and also figure out ways in which they can you know, advance their careers and hopefully pay it forward someday. So today, the topic that we are really going to be uh talking about has to do with user research this is something that you've done in all capacity of you know of your corporate life and I know that um, Arieda has worked for you know many gigantic organizations and bringing um, you know performing this sort of user research because you really cannot take on a project without really understanding what the current situation is understanding who exactly the users that are going to be affected by this is and how those users are going to pretty much interact with the things that the business change that you're delivering. So over the course of your 15 years uh, corporate experience, what would you say um, is, the, is what you found so intriguing about user research and what, what are the uh, misconceptions that people have about uh, conducting user research? What would you say? So I think I'll start with the misconceptions because the misconception for me, in my experience, is that user research is only down to the designers of a project because I've always worked in a project environment. So we have various we have various um, parties in the project. So you, you know, you have the business analyst, you have the design, the UX designers, UI, you know, you have the developers and stuff. And you just have all these different people all coming together to work to bring this project alive. And I think one of the misconceptions is that the user research is only down to the designer because they need to bring their expertise to design. Say, for example, we are trying to build a website. They need to bring their expertise to designing that website in such a way that if a, if a user lands on the website, they're able to navigate and have a good user experience as they go through, you know, the different aspects of your website but I think in my experience I've learned that user research is everybody's you know everybody's job do you understand because if you're building something you want to make sure that if it's a tree you're trying to build you want to make sure that it is the right height the right quality the right positioning people like it they see it and they're attracted to it and that's everyone's job to come around to say okay let us understand who our users are going to be? What is it that they? You have to. You have to understand the what. You have to. But more importantly, you have to understand the why. Why would anybody want to come to this website or use this service? Why would anyone want to pay attention to us? So the why is what drives the user research, and that user research activity is for everybody to get behind, so that the UX designers are equipped with what they need to do to bring out a valuable products, but every other member of the team also understands why they're doing what they're doing because it's always down to the users. It's always down to, you can't, if you build a product, it's not for you to enjoy. It's for somebody else to enjoy. And therefore you have to understand who are these people that we're building these things for to be able to bring out a quality product that is of value and moves the needle. Fantastic. So basically what you're saying is that regardless of what your role is, regardless of, you know, what hats you wear within product development, you could be a scrum master, you could be a front end developer, the UX designer, a quality assurance person, DevOps, regardless of wherever you are, if you are building a product and you are building a product for users to be able to use, it is important to understand the aspects of user research. And, and when you're talking about the user research, you talked about 
the who, and you also talked about um, that the most important aspect is the why. Why would anybody want to use this product? What exactly exists before this product came to the market? And why would they have to take a shift from whatever they're doing at the moment to what yeah. they want to, to, to your own product? What makes your product special? Yes. It, it, is it that? And so yeah. now, um, so, so guys, as you guys understand, this is, we're talking about user research. So I need to start seeing your questions. But before I start to look at the questions that we have in here, Another question that I that might intrigue um, a lot of our audience is that many of them are either trying to get on a career path or are trying to switch from one career path to the other. And you've said, based on what you're talking about, regardless of where they are, what the, whatever career path they are on that has to do with technology and has to do with business, um, they have to have that user, they have to know, have a bit of knowledge about user research. Yeah. So how do you think knowing user research can help you in your, you know, let's say in your interview or can help you in your day-to-day -day job? How would you, because many of them will be job hunting and many of them, once they get into that job in the beginning, they wouldn't, you know, understand the entire landscape of the organization. How would you say having this user research um, nailed down, how would you say that would help them to actually further themselves within the organization? Yeah, that's a good question. The thing is, the first thing is not to get overwhelmed with trying to understand everything before you go for an interview. The most important thing is that you have a thinking capacity to be able to think, right, when you now get into the job. Now, what I mean by that is, for example, if you're interviewing to join a I don't know, let me say media company, for example, they're looking for a business analyst or mm, let me even say they're looking for a designer. Let's just say designer. And they want somebody who can come in and, you know, design solutions that help their organization, help that project move forward. So for me, I would say understanding how to conduct user research is important. Knowing the processes, knowing the essential steps that you need to take to be able to conduct that user's research is more important than knowing what the project is upfront when you're doing the, inter in the interview because you don't know what you don't know. But when you join, you, what you can do at the interview is to sh demonstrate that you know how to conduct a user research. Now, the user research for what they need, you don't know it yet because you've not gotten the job, but you can demonstrate that you know how to conduct a user research, put me in any environment, put me in the market, put me in an office, put me in an airport. If they say to me, go and let, let us know who our users are, you know the steps that you need to carry out to be able to, to, be able to conduct a user research on any topic. That's more important than you trying to brag about knowing their project when you don't actually know the project when you don't actually know anything about what they're about to do so for me i would say if i go into an interview i'm fresh and new and they're asking me questions you know like okay we need a, a designer what do you think you can do for us that what why should we pick you over the 1000 people who replied well you t you tell them i have and um, you have a lot of skill sets in your arsenal and one of the skill sets that you've got, apart from really designing is or really writing business requirements or whatever it is that, they, that you are sat in front of is the ability to conduct effective user research. You know the tools, you know the steps that you need to take. You, and maybe you would even have a, a, an acronym for your steps already. You know, like I have a five step process that I can follow to be able to carry out an effective user research on any topic. Because... The process is the same across the board. If you're conducting user research, you are conducting user research. There's no special user research that is different in one industry that is different to the other. Maybe slight differences, slight here and there, but essentially it's the same process. So you can demonstrate that I have the skill set. I know what it is to, I know the first thing to do, second thing to do, third, you know, I know how to document all those things to then arrive at the perfect research for who the users are going to be for this particular project and that's what you need to demonstrate in that interview as far as i'm as far as i'm concerned anyway because nobody has all the answers but if you know how to get the answer that's more important in my opinion because it means that you you're thinking with your brain 
and your thinking capacity is wide enough to be able to find solutions to the problem rather than trying to brag about, oh, I know what your organization is about when actually, no, you don't. You've never worked there before. You don't even know what the project is about. Do you see mm -hmm. what I mean? So that's that's how I would approach it. That absolutely. That's for me, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, think that, I think that that just lures me into the next question, which is, so how exactly do you conduct effective user research? Because, you know, you said that this is the same in different in what, regardless of whatever domain you're going yeah. into or industry. So how do you conduct an effective user research? Okay, so I had to put some notes down from my yesteryears. I'm looking at another, I'm looking at the sort of PDF document that I put together, but I, I would, I, mean, I learned this from some, some experts as well, right? who put like a small, I would say, small process together. So that's how I learned as well. And he called it the research spiral, right? It's like a, it's like a loop that you have to go through. So first step, second step, and third step. So there are five steps. One of them is that you have to understand the objectives, right, of that particular, of why you are conducting this particular user research. What, what, what are we trying to do? So for example, let me give you a very good example, a live example. Um, there is a product that is to be launched. The product is for women and the product is to provide organic, um, organic um, material that women can use on a monthly basis. That's the project, right? And then you're coming in as the designer for the, I don't know, maybe let's just say the packaging of that product. Do you understand? Or you're coming in as the designer for the website for that product, or you're coming in as the designer for the app, uh, for the app for that particular product. What you want to establish to understand who the user is, is first of all, what is the objective of this organic material that you want, you guys want to bring out? What, what is it serving? So mm. that's the very first step. Why? What is this all about? Do you want to, what is it? You know, it's like, it's, that's the first thing. You need to understand the objective. The second thing that I noted is, sorry, let me just move this so that I can see without turning my neck. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Okay. The second thing is the hypothesis, right? The hypothesis is as a human being, you already have a preconceived notion about what it is that they're telling you. For example, if I if they say we want to build a we want to design a product that's 100 percent organic material for women, there are some thoughts that come to your mind about what they've just said to you. They may be wrong, but there are some thoughts that come in immediately. So that's your hypothesis. That's your common sense. Let me just put it that way. That's your intuition that, oh, okay, they want to design this. Oh, I see, okay, I think it's for, you know. And even though what you think is um may be faulty or may not be the complete picture, you have to have some I injection of your common sense into what they've said. So you, 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 you understand the objectives, you, you, you know, you've, you know, you, you've asked the right questions from the stakeholders. What is the objective of this? Now you now need to insert your own hypothesis, right? Hypothesis meaning that um, what you initially thought about it, your common sense about it. Then the third step is the methods. The method is how do you go from the objective that you've explained, your own hypothesis, right, which will be incorrect or not com not the complete picture. What's the method in filling those gaps, right? What is that? What what do you do to fill the gaps of your knowledge? That is, or or what what do you do to correct the preconceived notion that you had about it? So that's the third one. The fourth one is conduct. Now, conduct simply means, sorry, one second. Let me make sure that this does not go. Now, conduct simply means that you gather the, how you gather the data through the methods of the gaps that you did. So for example, let's start again. We say objective, you get that from the stakeholder. Hypothesis, you get that from your own brain and common sense. The third one, we said the method, that is how to, how to the method in filling the gaps of your own knowledge or of your of your misconception of, of, of your hypothesis. The fourth is the conduct. How now that you've now understood what those gaps are, the conduct of 
bringing that those gaps into the project itself and then the fifth one is synthesis that is now you now have a big picture you know the objectives you you have co been corrected on your hypothesis you you've conducted the method in which to fill those gaps you have um you have um, conducted the method in filling those gaps, the, the data that you conducted, the data that you gathered, sorry, through the methods. And then now the final thing is the synthesis. That is the big picture, the correction, everything that you now know about who is going to use this website that you are building is the final picture. So you go through those steps, right? And the first three steps are the most important because when you understand the objective, you already have like a, like, 90% of the picture already there because then you got this information from the people who want to build this thing. And then, you know, obviously bringing your skill set as a human being, as somebody who thinks, right? Because you've been living in this world, you know what the world is all about. When somebody says something like, oh, I want to be able to post on social media, you already use social media. So you already know the, the nuances of social media. So all of that is what you're bringing in your hypothesis, in your common sense, in your like, oh, but people don't post it in the middle of the night. They post in the morning or they post in the afternoon. You know, you, you already know some certain things. So you can bring that in your hypothesis. Then the third step, like I said, is the method, how you fill the gaps in your own knowledge from the objective and your own hypothesis. The fifth, like I said, is conduct, taking all of the data that you have now gathered and um, taking all of the data that you have now gathered and leveraging that on this picture that you are building. And then the fifth one, like I said, synthesis, which is like the complete picture. So I think as a youngster, or somebody who's looking to change their careers, it doesn't matter when or when you're looking to change it. If you go into an interview and they ask these questions about how do we get to understand who the users are going to be, you just tell them, listen, I have a five-step process that I follow. The process has been effective for me in, in other areas that I have used it in. It's very simple, and these are my steps. I want to understand the objective. I'm going to use my common sense to feel the... To, to build a picture of my own. I'm going to ask questions that help me fill the gaps in my knowledge. I'm going to conduct, I'm going to take all of that data and build a better picture. And the fifth one is synthesis. I'm going to build this picture and then try it out. By synthesis, I mean, after you have built the picture, you are now going to try, you're going to test it on people. You're going to ask questions of random people on the, on the streets and ask them if I, if a product was like this and you saw it on the app, would you like it? If you saw this as a, on a billboard ad, would you like the, you know, is synthesis is now testing everything that you have put together on real life people and asking them questions. And those people would give you back the answers to validate this picture that you've put together and either test your knowledge on whether you know what it is that you're doing and that you really understand what the users want or whether you're scrapping everything and starting all over again. That's what the synthesis stage will tell you. So if you go in and explain these things, um, I think you would be in a good place to get the job. Let me make okay. sure that my laptop doesn't die. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so let's let's take some questions. I have one question, but let's because yeah. there are quite a few questions here. But let's take those ones and we'll see if we have time for mine at the end. Um, so this is from uh, Joshua as it are, he said, must all user research be goal oriented? More specifically, at what stage of a project or product should user research occur? Yes, that's a good question. Um, it must be goal oriented in, in the sense that there is no, I mean, there has to be a reason why you are all gathered to carry out a project right and there's a goal at the end of everything there's a goal in every stage of the of the project that you're going through so yes it has to be goal oriented but bear in mind that the goal for user research is literally understanding the why why are we doing this because anything else outside why is a waste of time do you understand if you don't understand why you're doing it it means that as a designer or any other person on that project you 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 are not connected to the outcome of that project. Do you understand? You have to be connected to the outcome. And the reason, the, how you get connected is understanding why are we doing this? And especially if it is a noble co cause, well, all projects are noble, but if it's something that re is really exciting, that is fresh and brand new, or, you know, it, it connects you to that reason and it gives you that oomph to be able to, to be able to 
see that project to the end. So yes, understanding your why is important. As for me, that is the, the biggest goal. And then to the second part of your question about when do you conduct this at the very start, you can't conduct this in the middle because then it's like you driving a car and you're going somewhere <laughs> and you don't put on your sat nav until you're halfway through the, the journey. Like, how do you even start the journey in the first place? So user research is literally something you need to know at the very front of this project. Understanding it is so critical because that's what's going to help you design a fantastic solution. All right, fantastic. Um, thanks for that. So let's go for another question. Well, so this is from Awal. Awal is saying, what would be your advice on physical interaction with users during research? What would be my advice? Well, this physical interaction actually comes at the fifth stage, which is the synthesis, right? And although you're going to have some physical interaction with maybe stakeholders when you understand, when you're trying to understand the objectives, remember objectives in the beginning is asking the questions from the stakeholders. Why do you guys want to do this, etc. So whether it's at that very first stage of interacting with the stakeholders understanding their objectives or whether it's at the last stage where you've put your synthesis together and now you're testing it out on random people out there um my 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 advice is just to be yourself because here's where like um the maybe imposter syndrome comes in and i'm just going to piggyback on that for a second when you know what it is that you're saying you you don't need to have any kind of imposter syndrome and the reason, the how you know what you're saying is if you've gone through those steps, especially the steps one, two, three, four, before you start to talk to real life people in stage five, in step five, sorry. By understanding, by doing the work between one to four, when you're speaking to users, you're confident because you guys have, your you or your team and your team have done the work, you've come together, you've, you know, you've, you've, you've knuckled heads together, you've understood the methods, you understand the objective, you've put your hypothesis together, all of those things have happened. So that when you're now talking to users, you're just yourself and you're just asking them questions. So I'll give you a good example of that. There's a product that I, um, I want to launch in 2023. And I just took a random walk to the, to the, um, to the mall to ask women certain questions do you understand about this product that is coming out and you know i was just stopping random women whether they were young or old or you know caucasian or or, or black or white whatever it didn't matter to me i was just stopping random women and i was just myself so, hey you know if you saw a product like this and it was called this and you saw it on the shelves what would you think would you would you be drawn to it what are the colors that you think would attract you? If, if it had this color, would you be like, nah, I don't like this. If it had this name, you know, just asking them random questions. And I got positive. I, there was not a single person that said, why are you asking me? Do I know you? Why are you asking me questions? You see what I mean? Like, just be yourself, be natural, do the work before you approach people, speak up, you know, look at people's, you know, look people in the eye, essentially, when you're speaking to them and just ask your questions naturally but you already have done the work. So you're not just babbling to the air or you're not just, you know, feeling like lost in the conversation. You're actually owning the conversation by, you know, being polite, of course, always by saying, oh, can I just take five minutes of your time, please? You know, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. I promise it won't be more than that. And then you make it rapid. You go to the point, you ask them the question and you thank them at the end of it. And I think that's the best way to have that physical interaction is just being yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I, 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 I would agree with that because in terms of having physical interaction with your end users is extremely important for any business. And yes. if it happens that we, otherwise businesses are going to be building things out of what their own understanding is and you're not building a product for yourself, you're building it for other people to be able to purchase and use. Yes. And so if you can't talk to those users, the closer... Um, companies that really, really make it are organizations that are very, very close to their users because they are listening to what the users want. They are taking those feedbacks, and this can be in so many forms. You have organizations that create like a, um, an open roadmap where people can put like a future request, making people understand what they like and what they do not like within their product. And then doesn't mean they're going to act on it immediately, but this is giving them that sort of information. 
for them to understand that this is something that is extremely important to that organization as I right now. So yeah, like you mentioned, you can't overemphasize that physical interaction uh, with your users at the end of the day. Okay, so let's 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 go into another question. Bring this back. Um, so we have this is from Gloria Innocent. She said, What are the best tools used for user research? I think this is a good question. It is, but I don't understand. What what does that like mean? Me, you've talked about user research and while you were speaking, you mentioned you have to have a, a very good method. And also have you know the good tools that you could use for this user research. So could it be something as simple as user provided you understand the method, Microsoft Word is as good as you documenting it in there, or are there like special tools that you use within your, you know, your own expertise? Okay. Conducting? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah. When I was speaking about tools, I was actually speaking about the same thing, which is processes or a, a step you know, that you can follow in order to conduct that user research. But if you're talking about like tools like Microsoft Word or Excel and stuff like that, of course, those things come in handy because every single thing that you are doing has to be documented. It has to be documented, especially when you are doing the first stage, which is the objectives. You know, those questions need to be written down. They need to be, you have to conduct these interviews with the stakeholders, the owner of the business, for example. You have to write down every single thing that they're saying, document it in a, in a way that when you've, when you've documented it, you can share it with them. They can read it. They can say, yeah, you got, got what was in my head or no, you're completely off, off point here. So tools like, you know, Microsoft Word, of course, your PowerPoint presentations as well to be able to put real, really quick uh, PPTs together to sh to discuss with your stakeholders and stuff, and then you know at the end of the the process, which is the synthesis, maybe you want to even design little things like flyers or or what have you to be able to collect more information. So remember that uh, during the user research, you are all you're doing is collecting information. You're collecting information left, right, and center, and you are you and all your team are going back to crystallize what you've collected and documenting it. So. Very, very simple tools, you know, like your, your Word, your Excel, your PPTs and stuff is enough. I don't think that you need anything grand um, for user research, in my opinion, anyway. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, but there, there's so many tools out there that you could use, like you mentioned. They're the basic ones. But it's just all about your own style. How do you want to mm -hmm. document this? Miro is a very good tool for gathering user research, but you have to use the right templates. And you can find the user research templates there that could ask you, help you with those sort of questions that you want to ask. But then you still have to ask the right question in the right context. We've talked about asking the right questions, you know, a while ago is we said, there's no point in you saying, oh, I, I don't understand this. What does that even mean? The person can't help you. You have to be extremely specific so that you could get uh, people to answer your questions quite easily. And this goes back to the physical uh, questions as well, when you're saying physical interaction. One of the reasons why when Aria they conducted the physical interaction in the mall that apart from the fact that she's confident and bold to do so, the truth is that if you understand that you have, you, you're asking the right questions, are very direct, are very polite, you know exactly what you need to ask, and you've methodically gone through your steps, then you already know that the questions that you are asking the person is already going to be direct enough that they understand. It would be very silly to then ask people questions that are like, I don't really understand what you're talking about. And yeah. you, you know, that, you, that would dent your confidence. So in using different sorts of tools, you just need to use as basic, it doesn't, it's not as, it's not, the tool doesn't have to be fancy for the user research to make sense. Mm -hmm. There are so many tools out there but then it's just all about the method. Once you understand the method, you can put that into anything. Yeah, I agree. So there's another question here from Yemi. Yemi, yo. Yemi is saying, um, is it all projects to provide a solution that needs to conduct user research? For instance, to design a website for businesses. So I think if I'm understanding Yemi's question, is it like, do we have to conduct user research on every project? 
or is it you know if, if we are just designing a website do i still need to conduct the research um i think the answer to that for me is yes because for everything you're doing it's all about somebody else except if what you guys are doing is for like two people in the team i don't know i because I, I i won't understand why a whole project will come together for it not to go out to the world do you understand whether it is a website whether it's an app that you're building whether it's even a physical product that you are designing right there's all there's it it's always targeted at somebody else and therefore the moment it is not about you you have to you have to conduct user research if as long as it is not about you it's not only you using that website <laughs> it's not just going to be you using the app it's not just going to be you using that particular product that you're designing there's always the aspect of somebody else you have to conduct user research even if it's on a very small scale because you may have an idea in your head on how something should look like and that's the thing about being a designer or anybody on the project is that you have your own biases but it may not be what somebody else likes. Do you understand? Like I have an idea of how I want things to be, but I've found in my experience that I really, that's in your own head and in your own world and everybody doesn't think the same way as you think. Do you understand? I kind of like very simple things, but then I found out that actually people tend to like a little bit of complication here and there. And so you have to remove yourself from the situation and say, if this was 10 random people on the street, would they like this website? Will they understand this website? Will they get on there and be like, oh goodness, I can't even navigate to the checkout. It's too complicated, too many steps, too many, too many steps to get to checkout or too many steps to get to the store or too many, do you understand? Or, you know, it's like you have to remove yourself from that situation and understand what people like out there, which is why I gave the example of the mall because in conducting that research, even though it was a very small one and it, you know, it, it involved me walking end to end to the mall, I found out that at the end of the day, what I thought in my head wasn't just as right. I mean, I got 90% of people to be on my side of what I was thinking, but 10% of people gave me a different perspective. Like if you call it this, some people might be embarrassed to see this kind of name on a product. And I started to think it's true. Do you understand? Like maybe people with certain cultures or people with certain religions may be adverse to certain things. So you have to take everything into consideration and not just say, well, because I have the idea, I'm the expert and this and that, I'm just going to build it and people are going to like it. Actually, people will not like it and you'll be shocked. So that's why user research is valuable in any situation. As long as people are going to be interacting with that product, product no matter what it is, try to conduct a user research so that at least you are not wrong about your notions, which is why number two of the step, which is hypothesis, helps you to prove, disprove your biases and your faulty thinking about something when actually everybody's going north and you are trying to go south. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree. And yes. um, to, to further buttress what Amanda is talking about, Yemi, it's, yes, in as much as you're trying to, you could be a website developer and you, and you already think that, oh, yeah, analysis has already been done, um, design has already been done, all I'm just doing is to develop. But then if you don't understand the context of which you are developing, you know, sometimes it, it, it throws you out. So you want to understand what industry is this company I'm developing for actually in? Why exactly? Why why are they creating this this? So it will, and then why are they, why that will further make you understand why the designer has gone with a particular user journey and has gone with a particular look and feel. And then you would understand that, which would then allow you to know what sort of animations you can further use within that. If you don't fully understand the context at which you are doing something you have a very, very large tendency of just going based on your own intuition, which most of the time would be wrong because our, your definition of simplicity is different from my definition and different from every other person's. So we want to get everything right, which is why the very first thing is you have to take a step back on everything you have been given, try to understand where is this all coming from, and that is the whole user research that we're talking about. Now, user research in every aspect doesn't have to be extensive. Sometimes it has to be extensive. 
And sometimes it's just going to be something that can be done pretty quickly because a lot of those boxes have already been ticked for you. But then you still have to understand it for yourself. Otherwise, you're going to get into the project and do it something, you know, you have to then redo something that you, you could have gotten right the first time. So I think the, to, to your question, yes, is the answer. Okay, so we have just 10 minutes more before we finish. And... Um, uh, oh, okay, you're turning on the lights. You can see my <laughs> face. <laughs> it's blurring out in a way. Sorry, I should have turned this on. Okay, so... Sing? Yes. So this is another question. Been, been wondering, also been wondering about how best to identify and deal with bias in user research. How do you deal with You've your been wondering how to sorry let me read it again been wondering about how to best identify and deal yes so this bias is the hypothesis step two because remember hypothesis is your common sense about what the thing is what the what the what the website should look like or what the product should look like or you know who it is for and it and everything and by the time you do the objectives and you now table down what you believe to be what it should be or what you think it is, you then, how you deal with it is understanding that it is never about you. You It is always about, first of all, the state, the who commissioned it, who is the one paying for this project, who's the owner of this project, right? What it is that they, what it is, sorry, that they want to bring out to the world. So you remove yourself from that by looking at the objectives and looking at what you think and understand if there isn't any synergy between what is in both plates then you have to lean more towards the objectives of the of the company of, of the product sorry and then using the third step to fill in those gaps right to fill in the gaps of your of your own bias to fill in the gaps of your own misconception or your sort of like wrong direction in which you're looking at things you can't as a designer, there's a tendency to say, well, it's my skill set I, or, you know, whoever on the product, this is what I do. And I want to bring in, I want to leverage in my experience. And that's great. You, of course, you can absolutely do that. But you have to, in the place of, in the place of overtaking the objectives of the product, you have to take a step back and do that balance. Now, your hypothesis can also be tabled to the stakeholders because then they can see a different angle that they, they didn't consider as well. And they can disprove or approve what you're saying. Do you understand what I mean? And whatever they say should be your last, should be the final word on the, the idea or the thing that you are you are rigmaroling around, you know, as, as a bias. Just this is what I mean. So you can table your hypothesis, you can table your biases, you can table your ideas, you can do all of that vis-a-vis -vis what they have said. Table those things, let them tell you or no. No, 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 you're wrong. And this is what we want to do. But as long as those things are documented and you've shared it with them, then you can feel good about the fact that, okay, I brought in my 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 expertise. I brought in my own advice as a, as a designer and they don't want to take it. They want to go this other way. That's fine. But you've actually put it on the table for them to consider. And then you are always disproved. Even if the stakeholders don't disprove you, you are always going to be disproved in the last stage because that last stage is all about the users. Always understand this. It's all about, it's not, it's never about you. It's never even about the stake because the stakeholders can have an idea, but they also know that they're trying to sell a product. So if they're trying to sell a product, then the customers have to be interested in the product. So if the customers say they don't like this word on a product, they don't like this color, or they don't like a certain thing, and they insist that that's what they want, it's not going to sell. It's just not going to sell. And I'm going to give you a good example. This one is even about a movie. That's to show you that user research is important in anything. I, I know you guys may know this movie, Pretty Woman. Very popular movie, uh, Julia Roberts and stuff, right? Now, would, can you believe that the original script for Pretty Woman was that Richard Gere, I hope people know this yeah. I hope I'm not speaking. If you if you know this movie, please yeah, emojis make if you some noise. Pretty Woman, the very iconic movie. Okay, we yes, have it. Okay, so lots of hearts, yes. So the original script 
was that remember the how pretty woman ended richard gear got into the car drove to her house climbed up the stairs gave her the rose they lived happily ever after but the original script was that richard gear and uh, julia roberts actually went their separate ways can you believe that oh wow and that was the end of the movie and they showed the movie to a small group of people in a cinema and every single one of them were like how can you end a movie like this how can they not be together that is the whole point and they in the <laughs> they in the cinema told them how they should end the movie he should come in with his limo the limo quote and unquote acts like a horse you know like cinderella story he comes yeah, in a horse yeah, yeah. Table. so yeah. instead of a horse comes in with a limo and everything and mm -hmm. just that change has made that movie relevant till tomorrow, till next week. Even if you've watched, you know, um, Pretty Woman 20 times, it's still an interesting <laughs> movie to watch again. Do you see what I mean? But yeah. just because of that tiny re user research that he did, changed the whole trajectory of that movie. It tells you it is so important that people get behind what it is that you're doing. Otherwise, you're just dreaming on your own, making mistakes and thinking people are going to like it and people don't. And by the way, remember, the movie was already over. They had paid, everybody had been paid. The, it was time for them to roll out the movie and go and uh, let it go into cinema, into the cinema's box office and stuff. They called, we recalled the actors back just to do that end scene. And of course, it, it meant they spent a lot of money trying to do that because they paid everybody, bring back the trailers, bring back the actresses, fly them in and, and all of that. But they rather did that. And they are still making money from the movie today for just that change. So sometimes it's not about the money. It's, not, it's about the end. It's about the glory of the end. And the glory of the end is in the users liking what it is that you put together. So hopefully that gives you... <laughs> yeah, I'm glad they, I'm glad they made the fairy tale. Because that would yeah. have just really like seriously that's what exactly just said, nah <laughs> <laughs> so i'm glad you yeah so you understand the importance of user research now is so it's like it's like everything is is everything about what it is that you're doing okay so this this question let me put this one that's been here for a while following what you um so this is from michael following what you mentioned about user research being the duty if every product development unit, I think it's saying in every product development unit, how do you then balance unique user research insights? And how do you determine whose insights is used for developing the product's foundation? I think that's kind of like similar to what you've answered, isn't it? I, I have to admit, I don't understand the question. It, it okay. seems a little bit convoluted to me. Okay, so let's break it down. So it's saying following you mentioned, uh, following what you mentioned about user research being the duty of every, every. product development unit. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So the question comes in, how do you then balance user research insights? So like the insight that's come out of a user research, how do you balance that? And how do you determine whose insight is used for developing the product's foundation? So is it the insight okay. of the stakeholders or the insights of the, you know, the end users or whose insight at the end of the day is used in developing the product? Okay, I'll, I'll take, take it a step further that maybe he's also trying to ask that who, which team is... Um, which, because I've said that everybody in the team should understand the user, should conduct some sort of user research, even if it is a tiny little bit in their own space. So I'm thinking that maybe, are you saying that is, are you also saying, sorry, that is it the designer's sole responsibility in, I mean, is it the designer's final say of what the user, user research process is, is the foundation? Or maybe to what you're saying to me, is it the, end users or is it the stakeholders so let, let me address the one how you put it to me if you go through the steps you would understand that it is the users it is the last stage that gives you the final picture of how you because the way sorry he said whose insight is used for developing the product's foundation so foundation being the beginning right sorry this question is a little bit uh, complex but Again, I'm, I mean, very happy for you to quickly type it in and make it simple. But if you're talking about foundation, the foundation is coming from the stakeholders, which is the very first thing, which is the objectives. Because they are the ones who are commissioning the work. You are not the one who's commissioning the work. So they, it, is their, it is their insight 
that starts the foundation that commissions this whole thing. But as a developer, uh, sorry, as a designer or whoever is on that team, um, you have to understand that when you understand what they're talking about, then you have to follow those steps, the remaining four steps. Because the, even though the stakeholder has something in their head, to understand of what it needs to be, you as the expert, you're now telling them that, okay, fantastic, you want to build a tree that has golden leaves. Okay, we get it, right? We're going to take what you want and we're going to take our expertise to give you the end product of what you've said you wanted. So that's why it is good to have a process in which you're following so that at the end of the day, you're going to present it back to them and say, listen, you wanted a, gold, you wanted a tree with gold leaves. It is impossible to get a, gold, a tree with gold leaves, but you can get one with brown leaves. And this is what the users are saying, that they would like this instead of that. Because no one wants to throw money at something that is not going to sell. Remember, every business is there to sell. They are there to make money. They are there to generate revenue. And even if they are dreaming about the biggest thing on the planet, if it's not going to sell, they're wasting their time and they've paid you as the designer and the team to carry out this work. So they will listen. That's why you start as an expert by telling them, we know what we're doing. We know the processes that we're going to follow. And at the end of the day, we're going to give you the true picture of what this product needs to look like. So if you're starting from the foundation, obviously the objective is the, is the stakeholder. If that is, if that is what your question is, if mm. you are talking about the end, it is always the user. Always remember Julia Roberts and G Richard Gere. Remember that example for the rest of your life. And it will help you determine how important it is that fifth stage is, right? And if it is coming from you understanding that your biases should be thrown out of the window, you should be logic in putting it to the table and canceling it out where it doesn't fit so that you don't stand in the way of your own progress. Do you understand? And, and, and you know, not that you, you don't bring your common sense, oh, you, you do, but well, I, I think make sure you're balancing it. Right I said he, he, he okay. meant which is I meant different teams. Okay. In in the design in this whole process, the designer, the UX designer is king. The reason why it is important for every other person to get on board is if you're a business analyst, for example, on the project, you have to understand what why you are writing the, the requirements that you're writing. Do you understand? Even though you're capturing it from the stakeholder's point of view, but you have to understand, and that way, the way you understand is knowing who the end product for this user is going to be. Even if you are not completely correct, at least having that hypothesis in your own mind, as well as the scrum, as well as the project manager, as well as everybody on the team. But when you're talking about user research in its entirety, it is it falls squarely on the UX designer because they are the ones who are designing. They're the ones who are putting the colors, the flow together, the, you know, the everything together. They're the ones who are merging this beautiful world of what the user is going to experience. Do you understand? And that is why it falls, it, it's, their, it's their job of the, of the designer. But it, every other person on the project has to get on board with that as well. They have to be clued on, on what is going on. And that's why the, user, you, the UX designer, one, one of the things you can do is to be at the forefront and sharing your findings with the rest of the team so that they don't even need to go out to go and conduct a different type of user research. You can say, this is where we are. These are the things that we've discussed with the stakeholders. This is the documentation on it. So that you get everybody on board and everybody understands, okay, this is where we're going and they're leading the conversation. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, considering we don't have a lot of time um, and we still, we've actually run out of time and we have just very, we still have about four questions. So okay. I think we'll take maybe two of the four that so if you whichever one you guys want us to the last two can you upvote them guys so that we can put that up so what's the scope of asking relevant questions on a product i think we can make this one very like very short the answers what is the scope of asking relevant questions the scope um so if, if i'm to answer this one i'll just say Yes, it goes, without, it goes without saying. Asking relevant questions, regardless of what you are doing, user research or not, is is actually um, important. But if you are going to put it in a structure, is that what are you trying to achieve at the end of the day? Try to make whatever question you're asking very, very smart. Use that uh, acronym SMART. Anytime you're confused, go back to the acronym SMART. You have to be specific. You have to be measurable. 
it has to have something that is achievable, realistic, and time bound. So if you want to ask somebody, if you want to say, I don't understand, you have to say exactly what you don't understand. You ask the question about this and this and this during while you were speaking two days ago. I really mm -hmm. did not understand this aspect of it because it confuses me on this. And can you kindly elaborate? That question there is fully, fully smart because the person understands your context, they understand why you don't understand, and they understand you fill them in in the in the current situation and exactly what aspect of it that you're finding confusing. So mm -hmm. I think um that that answers that one. Um <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find this. They're very um, this is another one. In a system, where do you have a time? Uh, okay, where you have a time constraint, limited yeah. time, carry out your research. How do you go about it? So, in a, so this is like in a situation yeah. where you don't have enough time. How do you yeah. carry out your research? How do you go about it? Yes, you know, to be honest, there's always time constraints on everything, on every single project. You know, do you understand? But if the you if you've got a really really time bound, you know, situation then don't mock about in terms of those five steps, right? Quickly get the stakeholders into a room. If you can't get them into a room to ask questions, you can do conduct interviews via, you know, via um, Skype or Zoom or, you know, Microsoft, whatever it is that you can lay your hands on. And always work in your teams. Let somebody be, I don't know, maybe putting the questions together, another person, you know, organizing how you guys are going to meet the stakeholders. But the very, very important that you get the stakeholders as the very first st step to understand the objectives because you can't start any part of that project without understanding what what it is that they want so you can't go off with your hypothesis or you can't just you can't ask the user research. you can't go to the stage 5 for example so i would say if you if you're time bound quickly as a matter of fact at least carry out the first step within the first week let that be done right and then all other steps your hypothesis, your, your you can do that within, you know, you can work on a time, on a time schedule that, okay, we're going to use 48 hours to put all our hypothesis together. Use sticky notes, always very important, very useful. So gather your team together and put this, them sticky notes on the walls. If you don't have time to be, you know, drawing diagrams and stuff, just get those sticky notes on the walls and start to, you know, start to put your ideas all on that wall vis-a-vis -vis the objectives that you've gathered very important and then let your team take pictures of it work on it you know do you understand instead of trying to make things perfect try to maximize your yeah in fact actually that's the answer rather than trying to look at the time maximize your focus on every single thing so your focus is get the objectives get that done the next focus is let us all vomit everything that we're thinking in terms of our hypothesis and our biases about what they've told us get sticky notes don't look for perfection get that done and just go through the processes really really fast so that even if you arrive at the fifth stage in two weeks of doing this user research you would have you would be surprised on what you've achieved in the last two just looking back because you've maximized your focus on all the other four steps so that's what i would say the first get the first step out of the door really quickly and then focus on the other four okay thank you um, so, Michael, again, how do you find valuable research data in situations where you can't have a physical interaction with a target representative? Okay. And I'm, I'm assuming that this is for the fifth stage, right? Valuable research in data where you can't have physical interactions. Okay. What you can do is there's a lot of information out there, right? There's a lot of information out there. And there's no new, there's nothing new, quote and unquote, under the sun, as they say, in terms of product, right? So what you can do in those situations is to look for data in similar, in similar um, products or similar services. Do you understand? I always like to model what is already out there. In fact, it's my favorite line ever. If it's existing, why, why would I want to reinvent the wheel? Do you understand? And so in re user research, even though that's different to what I'm saying, but if you don't have that opportunity and I don't understand how you won't have it, but let's just assume that you don't have it at all, then what you can do is think on your fit, use what is out there, you know, go and find data. There's data everywhere. Go and find data on something that exists that is similar. Use that as a yardstick, right? 
But I would say that remember you're creating something that is unique to you and your organization. So you can't rely on that data 100%. Even if you use that data to start or to kickstart the conversations or to build your, build your, your picture, find a way to at least get something that is authentic that you guys have done for your own product so that you don't miss the mark. Because the fact that there's data out there doesn't mean that the data is 100% correct. And data yeah. is also always changing as well. So something that was printed last week or last month or whatever may have shifted a little bit. Do you see what I mean? So, But you can certainly use what is out there to at least start the process and get the ball rolling. As so well. add to that, at the moment, um, there are so many other um, user research and market research agencies and tools that you could also yeah. add to where they, they have a whole lot of those users, if you can't physically touch them, but then you could go on to, and they're quite very, very expensive to actually find them. Um, you could, so many organizations, that's what they do to get thousands and thousands of people, millions of people at once. And so they use digital user research and use that in talking. So yeah. I use that in talking to them. This goes with the, uh, similar to the next question, we're talking about survey questionnaires. Is it, is it okay to just use survey questionnaires for user research? For a product or project without carrying out a physical interview. So I think both, both, both of them are, are, are basically similar questions. So uh, one of the things that, like for Tech1M, for instance, um, one of the things that we had to do, even though there are some physical people, but because what we are doing in Tech1M is global and we can't touch everybody everywhere in the world. So what we had to do is to enlist um, the services of sophisticated market research companies that use machine learning and understand people's biases and, you know, and to be able to carry out a bit of user research so that the things that we are ending up, you know, producing and what we are developing is not yeah. just going to be based on what we already know is a problem, but maybe that problem the way we are solving the problem might not be the best way they want us to solve the problem. In terms of the problem, might be we all experience the problem. However, what is the best way to solve the problem? By the time you get closer to your users and you're able to speak to your users, you really understand what they are finding as their own major pain point and how they best believe that this can be solved. And this allows companies to build better products. And so that is why market research, so if you can't touch your users physically, you can use um, different organizations. There's user, there's um, usability. Um, there's Deep Loop, which is one we are using. There's a whole lot of organizations out there that charge a ton of money, but then help you to understand what your users are saying and put it in a contextual way while they are using um, data. And they're also using machine learning to be able to get those answers. So I don't know if you want to chip into that because this is the last one. Last question, I yeah. No, absolutely. As in speaking to, you've said it all, you know, obviously there are organizations out there. You have to pay money, of course, to use them. But if you are like a small fish, for example, bringing out your, <laughs> bringing out your product or service, you can't afford them, then just use what you use what is available to you to the second to the last question which was the questionnaire so for example if i was trying to conduct that uh, market research during covid when everywhere was locked down and nobody was out what am i going to do i'm just going to go on to you know google forms or something and you know just put a bit of questions there right everybody is on some whatsapp group or, or the other you know send it out ask your friends please send it out to your family members just a few questions i'm trying to gather some get some data and that can even be very very more effective actually that is if you're a small fish obviously if you're a very big company you can't do all those things so you need to enlist the help of um, of agencies like deep loop etc like uh, tommy has said but if you're a small fish you're trying to bring out something even if you're a medium fish you know you're trying to bring out something that you can't really carry out that physical interaction or you want to use another method absolutely bring a form together put your questions succinct because people get tired of going through multiple questions on the form make sure it is succinct it's direct it's straight to the point and ask the questions you want to ask and send it out there and you'll be surprised people take five minutes or ten three minutes of your time to fill out your survey and there you have it user research conducted from the from the comfort of your living room and you haven't even stepped out so yeah you can absolutely do that all right, thank you. Thank you so much, Arande. So we've gone way, way over and we it's time to end this now. Um, yeah. Just before we say bye-bye to 
one and to actually say bye bye to the end of the year and the end of a wonderful 2022. I wanted to make um, for those of you that are taking the um, Tech One and Work experience um, early next year, we have received quite a number of requests for for jobs um, that we are going to be putting on the platform. So where you guys are doing your work experience. So look out for it. So it goes with digital marketing, because I saw someone say, Michael saying, oh, what, what about marketing? So there's a whole lot of digital marketing roles uh, uh, with a lot of firms that are out there. So we're going to be putting those on the platform. Um, there's a lot of roles on product designers, website designers, um, data analysts, um, you know, um, pretty much all the, all, all the areas, the, the web developers, um, front end, back end. So look out for that. And we are going to be showing that to the guys taking the work experience very uh, first. But the responses we are getting from um, the companies which you are doing your work experience is key. And that will play a large part in your recommendation. So um, that said, we can we please um, thank Karia Day for giving us our, our time today. Um, let's use our emojis like we do. And um, thank you, everyone, for staying. We are going to be having Aria Day again sometimes in January, and where we're going to be discussing a different topic. And I hope you guys have you, know, you guys have had a very very lovely 2022. I have. It's been filled with so many things. And of course, those of you that are here that has made Tequanem quite interesting for us. We have an exciting journey in 2023 and we can't wait to have all of you guys there empowering us as we empower you to. Temerade, thank you so much. We wish you from Tequanem and everyone, we wish you an amazing 2023. And every single person here, I we just wish you guys the best, the best year ever in 2023 so bye bye guys and have a lovely night bye everyone thank you for having me bye, bye. happy new year <laughs> happy in new advance year. <laughs> bye thanks very much <laughs>